Hello, I'm David Gordon Koch, reporting for the MB Media Co-op in Moncton, where we've been holding a series of media production workshops for people involved with the NB Common Front for Social Justice, a grassroots anti-poverty and social justice organization. Five sessions have taken place at the Moncton Public Library since the beginning of February, focusing on some basics of DIY journalism and video production. One of the people taking part is Robert McKay, community co-chair of the NB Common Front for Social Justice. McKay emphasized in his interview that after housing costs, individuals are often left with scant resources, sometimes as little as two or three hundred bucks uh, to live on. His advocacy journey began within New Brunswick Mental Health System as a service user where he connected with individuals advocating for change in the mental health system. Inspired by peer support programs in uh, the United States, McKay envisions a similar model in New Brunswick where individuals with lived experience of poverty be could become, he says, a whole new workforce contributing to mental health services while transitioning off of social assistance. These interviews are part of a bigger project which the NB Media Co-op is working on, looking at issues including mental illness and poverty in New Brunswick, told from the perspective of people with lived experience of poverty. So make sure you watch our website for the forthcoming documentary from the NB Media Co-op and Common Front for Social Justice. You can find that at nbmediacoop.org. Also, don't forget to follow us on YouTube at NB Media Co-op. And we are also, at least for now, still on the platform formerly known as Twitter, also at NB Media Co-op. And we're not on Facebook or Instagram because, as you probably know by now, their parent company, Meta, shut down all Canadian news accounts last year. That makes it harder for us to reach our audiences. So if you support what we do, please consider joining the co-op. We ask for a monthly or annual contribution of any amount. Just go to nbmediacoop.org and click on join slash donate. We go now to uncut footage from our collaboration between the NB Common Front for Social Justice and the NB Media Co-op. Stay tuned. So I'm speaking with Robert, Robert McKay from the New Brunswick Common Front for Social Justice. Thanks for speaking to the MB Media Co-op today. Oh, you're very welcome, David. Thank you for having me. Uh, so you're a longtime anti-poverty organizer here in Moncton, New Brunswick. How long have you been working on this kind of activism? How did you get involved in this kind of activism? Yeah, with the Common Front, per se, I've been uh, with them, say, five years or so, give or take. And I'd done other stuff, uh, I'd say foundational to getting into this uh, for 25 years. I've been doing stuff with people with lived experience and trying to, trying to demonstrate the value of human beings who have lived experience beyond tokenism. And you have your own lived experience uh, mm -hmm. with poverty. Uh, you, um, uh, your income is from social assistance. Mm -hmm. How long have, have you been on social assistance? Oh, uh, on and off throughout my life, uh, you know, I've probably been on social assistance or EI benefits, you know, half my life, more, maybe more, a good part of it. Uh, kind of a little bit of a misfit, perhaps, to coin a phrase. What, what's it like trying to uh, make ends meet on social assistance? Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Uh, if you can put the housing part in place, so like if you can get a rooming house room for $380 a month, you can kind of scale your life around getting a $637 check, more recently an $837 check, wow, you know. But you look at those numbers, basic math, 837 minus 380 or 480 for some people in my same building, doesn't, doesn't you can do the math on that, there's not a lot to, to live on, a couple of hundred bucks, two, three hundred bucks to live on. For all your food and uh, phone everything. bill, or uh huh, everything, yeah. So you wind up ha having to depend on food banks and soup kitchens and things of this nature. Oh, if if I didn't if I didn't live where I do and have access to all those things, life would be pretty much unmanageable. So, what about the cost of medication? How does that factor in? Yeah, thankfully, uh, with social assistance, you've got the white card. So that covers off most of the medication that I need. Every now and then you'll get a prescription for something and it's not covered, but most of it's covered. So that's good. So how did you get involved in activism? Uh, going way back, 
Um, I got involved in activism through New Brunswick's mental health system and uh, I had a burnout in my life, just burned out of the workplace and was uh, uh, getting mental health services a little bit and, and I came across people that were doing activism within the mental health system, funded, uh, allegedly funded by the province, you know. Uh, here and, in Moncton. Here in Moncton. I met some people that were involved in that and uh, got involved in committee work and uh, uh, with a variety of different committees and boards and uh, advocacy oriented, wanting to make a change, wanting to make positive change in mental health and that sort of thing. That's how I initially got into it uh, around 1997, 98, a long time ago. And you traveled to the U.S., uh, to the state of Georgia, I believe, in, in 2005, and learned about a peer support kind of program in the social services down there. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, wow. That's, what, that's the key word, wow. Uh, I had met uh, this guy. I, I was the first Canadian, so to speak, to officially connect with a guy named Larry Fricks, a cool guy from North Georgia. And Larry uh, was one of the granddaddies of the uh, certified peer specialist program down in Georgia. And um, so having uh, met him back in 2004, I, uh, I was still in New Brunswick. I moved to Toronto and got involved with the mental health recovery groups and stuff like that and um, wanted to go in. I was uh, immersed in, in that kind of area where people wanted to know about recovery in different ways. So I said, I'm going to go down on a bus, went down to uh, St. Simon's Island, I believe it was, and uh, went to their summer conference. And wow, what an eye-opener. Um, so it covered a lot of ground beyond Certified Peer Specialist Program. But as a Canadian who was really a cheerleader for this, I brought the flag of Canada from my member of parliament, you know, and, and they let me have the stage and, and like so, um, showing how interested I was. But I heard when I would get having individual conversations with people over and over again, these people would talk about how being a certified peer specialist had saved their lives, had changed their lives. I, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. What is the certified what peer is, specialist? What is, what is peer support? Yeah, yeah the, the idea behind it is that, the, as in starting from New Brunswick, they say in the system they wanted to have contributions from people with lived experience and uh, contributing in the, in the mental health system. And how far do they want to take that, right? So I, when I went to Ontario, I saw it being brought to a different level with people being paid uh, to do uh, jobs to help their fellow mental patients, uh, people who've been through the mill. Um, and, and that's what peer support sort of is, is that people with lived experience of a problem who then maybe even are determined to be the problem in a certain system, take that lived experience as they move towards their own recovery and getting capable of, of using that lived experience, they use that life experience of difficulty to inspire hope in their fellow, in their fellows who are, who are not as far along as them, they're mentors for recovery, and they have this knowledge of what it's like. So, so I've seen some of that in Canada, and then when I went down to the States, they had, they had codified it. Uh, Medicaid down there had, had um, allowed agencies to bill for it. And that's when it really took off, is when it, instead of being a token, uh, there were jobs for people, and lots of jobs as time went on, for people to uh, get uh, involved with agencies, gaining the respect of people in, in these agencies, professional, uh, what have you, and, and using that knowledge to not only help their peers, but also to help those teams of professionals who needed to have, who needed to have the customer on their team in those like secret interdisciplinary meetings. And it's, it's up the game for, for people and, uh, and it's increased results of recovery and people getting better. So, so better social inclusion for, for people with mental health issues and on the other hand creating jobs uh, for people who might have difficulty getting them otherwise, yeah. right? And, and you tried to get this, something like this implemented in, in New Brunswick. Yeah. Talk about that, how did that go? 
Yeah, I guess maybe I was just slightly ahead of my time, like Panasonic, I guess. So, um, so I had taken these ideas as early as 1997 when I kind of was having my burnouts and getting involved in the mental health system. I really voraciously was learning about what was going on in, in places like Massachusetts and outside of Georgia, but Massachusetts even before then, where they talked about consumers as providers and it's that that germ of a mental health workforce and I was learning about that and um, so in New Brunswick I tried I, because um, I, it just so happened the way I got in was a guy who had been involved as an activist but kind of retiring and I got all his boards and committees and stuff and so all of a sudden I was going from zero to uh, 60 uh, on all of these involvements so I tried to bring all this knowledge of what I was learning from the from the states and from Ontario it was also big but the states in particular and say why can't we do that in New Brunswick so every committee I was on every board meeting I was on I would I would take these lessons and I would uh, you know bring it to all of these uh, organizations to try to increase awareness and get people excited about it and why can't we do it here so uh, for f four years, let's say, I, I went on on that track. I got little mini grants and, and stuff like that to get a skeleton thing going. And in 2001, we had a we had a what I thought was an agreement from the top of the heap, the big shots in Fredericton, who said, um, you know, congratulations, you've got your new uh, organization, and it's going to be the first in the enhanced version of these drop-in centers and stuff focused on employment. And but um, how do I say I was maybe I was too vigorous in my advocacy and I kind of pissed off uh, somebody in in the system and they kind of kiboshed it. The sad part about it is uh, you know um, they got me to leave the organization and as soon as I did, all my friends who were on there who were peers and people that had been nurtured to get empowered got got taken over by the professionals and they just they just sunk the ship yeah that's really unfortunate uh, but you know now uh, all these years later uh, as we, you know we see that there's this social crisis uh, people on the streets of, of uh, Moncton and yeah. other parts of New Brunswick uh, uh, definitely a lot of mental health issues definitely a lot of drug problems and yeah. poverty uh, well with with all of this happening, do you see a role for this kind of peer support? Is trying to, you know, do you see this being potentially implemented in New Brunswick? I maybe I'm a rose-colored glasses guy, but I see opportunity when I see the scale that we have in New Brunswick, uh, Moncton area in particular. Uh, we may be the the capital in North America for homelessness, according to uh, ratios and analysis that some people have done. We've got a big enough problem that we could scale it and we could, uh, um, as a uh, meeting that I had last uh, September uh, with my organization, we met with the Minister of Social Development and pitched different things, but when we got on to the homelessness and housing problems and stuff, I said, Minister, uh, you know, you, you could have a whole new workforce in there of people who were on the street who are taking a step up that ladder and getting better and uh, I've seen it south of the border and based on what I see of the size of these uh, Michigan or Georgia they've got maybe 3,000, 3,500 people working in, uh, in the big workforce maybe up here we could get dozens and dozens and dozens of new jobs of people who are now on social assistance um, maybe even a couple hundred, two or three hundred jobs that she could fund and they would be jobs that would pay for themselves they would be doing the same thing in Canada now and in New Brunswick, uh, if, if done correctly, that I saw happen in the States. And it just turns the logic on its head, the paradigm on its head. And we could do this in New Brunswick. What do you mean when you say it would pay for itself? It would, it would pay for itself. You're, you're uh, taking people off social assistance. You're, you're uh, bringing in people with a whole new type of knowledge. Um, and you're getting people better based on experiential results of what works. Uh, part of the, the peer specialist idea is that these people are, are role models for recovery. They inspire hope. And so not only in the, in the peers, in the people on this, that are laying down on the street, but uh, in many 
instances, many instances, it's the hope that it inspires in the systems themselves. After professionals get used to the idea that they've got a former crazy person working on their interdisciplinary team, they start saying, okay, all of a sudden, well, that's not so crazy after all. And they start to start thinking like the customer, they get to learn better the reality. And if you can understand the reality and the problem, you have to understand the problem first before you can solve it, right? And that's how they can, and that'll drive down the cost. Your, your system will work better, your results will be better, people will be, um, it'll drive the cost down. How many X number of people won't be institutionalized, won't be in special care homes? What, it just, I guess the, the, the idea is that if, if people are lifted out of poverty, there'll be less strain on the healthcare system as well. Uh, as people will lead healthier lives. The whole it? thing. And my understanding of the their results, particularly in Georgia, which I followed pretty closely uh, up until re you know, recent years, but when I was more uh, heavily into it, uh, they have saved a lot of money, a lot of money in their, in their uh, mental health systems in the state of Georgia. And I'm sure that uh, it's in other states as well and people with more clout than I, if we can get the Jill Greens of the world and the deputy ministers and the, the folks to go and talk to the uh, people in the United States and to see what's happening and to crunch the numbers on the reporting that they'll give, I think that we will see that it's, it is saving that money and it's something, why can't we do something different in New Brunswick? And I guess maybe saving a lot of lives too. Save a lot of lives. I, I heard that over and over again. In 2005, when I went to the summer conference on St. Simon's Island, over and over again, people, they'd see me on the stage with the Canadian flag and they wanted to come and talk to me, and they'd say over and over, becoming a certified peer specialist saved my life. It, it made my life. It made me, it turned me around into something. And so when, uh, when we see, uh, beyond mental health, but in all aspects of society, um, some of the things we've already talked about, some of the persons we've already interviewed for this project, we see how these people are misfits. And the genius of this is that society down there, enough of society, of the established society, the big players, recognize that the value of these misfits is beyond tokenism, it's dollars and cents for taxpayers. Do you consider yourself a misfit? I, I, I do consider myself a misfit, absolutely, yeah. For various, for various reasons, it's been, uh, it had been tortuous for me to fit into normal society for many, many years, decades, and to fit into normal jobs, uh, just seeking by, and, and, and uh, misfits are, are a wide and diverse army and some of them look like misfits and some of them don't look like misfits uh, but it's a big a cohort of people I'm proud to be a misfit anything else to add um, you've covered it uh, pretty well I would say I just hope that uh, all the work that uh, that I've done and others have done uh, you know will come to some for form of uh, positive fruition and this is part of it, getting the word out there is, is helpful, so thank you for that, David. Right on. Thank you so much, uh, Robert McKay of the NB uh, Common Front for Social Justice. Thanks thank for speaking to us. Thank you.